Nene, and welcome back to another Comedic Bite. I'm your host, Sharon, and I have a great question from Onions United. I love the username. And Onions United asked, Do you believe in evolution, the Big Bang, and so forth? That is a great question, considering that about the time you asked that, a uh, short time afterwards, Stephen Hawking passed away. And so there's been a lot of talk about uh, the work that he did, his contribution to the field of astrophysics, and then, you know, the reactions from people in religious communities, and then, you know, so on. First of all, yes, I believe in evolution. In fact, I feel that believe is the wrong word for that, because believe suggests that even in the absence of measurable data, you still have faith that a certain idea is true. With things like evolution, we can find evidence of it, you know, uh, and not just in the fossil record either. Uh, and by the way, there's lots of things that they do to study fossils and to a determine their age, radiocarbon dating and things like that. Uh, before my, I was interested in ancient Egypt as a kid, I was interested in dinosaurs. And so, you know, as a, an elementary school kid, I was all about dinosaurs. And this was before Jurassic Park. So, you can see evidence of evolution on a small scale. For example, when plants crossbreed and you get something different, uh, when different varieties of corn cross-pollinate. And uh, they, they tell you if you're going to plant certain kinds of corn, don't plant it anywhere near popcorn because you'll end up getting a weird crossbreed. Over time, that uh, can give you something new. Another example would be most of our domestic animals, dogs, cats, and other things. They're descended from wild ancestors. For example, Yotsuba. See, all domestic ducks are descended from mallards. And you know mallards don't look as white and pretty and cute as my little Yotsuba, my most special duck in the universe. And so this is an example of selective breeding. She is a Welsh Harlequin, actually, and that is a fairly rare breed, which is less than 100 years old. She's also related to... There we go. Oh, say hi, Indiana. Indiana is a khaki camel. They're a more nervous breed. They're actually about 120, 140 years old. They're developed in the late 1800s in England. There was a lady named Mrs. Campbell who bred a couple of other breeds until she got these pretty babies. Say hi, Indiana. That's just what humans selectively breeding animals in a short amount of time can do. If you imagine the forces of nature working over many millions of years, and influencing the uh, uh, which animals get to pass on their genetics over time, it's easy to see how you can go from dinosaurs to total cuteness. Of course, the problem with this comes in when we try to apply principles of things like evolution to ourselves. You know, the idea that humans are descended from apes. Frankly, considering how some people act, I'm not surprised. But in all seriousness, it can be difficult because, for one, the idea that human beings descended from another type of animal uh, contradicts a number of different religions' teachings, but also it can be kind of difficult to deal with because we all want to feel like we came from something special. And facing the reality of our origins, either as an individual, um, especially when you figure out that your parents probably shouldn't have gotten married in the first place, for example, uh, or on a macro scale that human beings descended from other apes, you know, that, that sort of idea uh, can be tough to deal with, and everyone deals with that on, in their own way, I think. But let me offer this bit of, of thought on that. Each generation is supposed to surpass their parents' generation. And if you don't do that, then that's on you. Now, multiply that over millions of years. And maybe that lets the idea of humans being descended from another primate not seem so hard. Now, on to the Big Bang. I love astrophysics, except for the math part. Uh, I have a cousin who is a uh, Hubble Fellow and PhD astronomer, so uh, you know that kind of interest sort of runs in the family. 
It's important to remember, though, that with science, our knowledge and our scientific body of work moves as our technology does. Remember in a previous video I was talking about the fact that uh, we didn't even know about the existence of Uranus, Pluto, and uh, Neptune, and opposite are Neptune and Pluto, until the last couple of hundred years because our telescopes got better and our telescope technology and our digital imaging technology is getting better and better and we're learning more things practically every month about the nature of the universe and you know our place in it so something could be given as a fact right now but we could discover something tomorrow that changes all of it another thing to keep in mind in the 1950s people actually thought it was okay to put radium in toothpaste and bottled water. Yes, radium, the radioactive element. They thought it was okay, because at the time, it wasn't widespread knowledge that that stuff can kill you. So, when I was a kid, uh, the going knowledge was that you had the Big Bang, of course, and that the universe would end in a big crunch when everything would fall back in and the process would cycle over again, which does match a lot of you know, religious beliefs, you know, about cycles and, you know, beginning of the universe, end of it, and so on. Now there's some talk about maybe everything will fall into black holes or just dissipate or the universe will go on and on forever. But you know what? That could change too. So, when it comes to science, you really need to have an open mind. And science is its relationship with our beliefs. That needs to not be so tightly opposed. And that's the big problem that I see. Science and religion should not be enemies. This, and, and in the past they weren't. This has really only been a recent phenomenon if you think about things like the Scopes Monkey Trial in the 1920s, you know, and uh, uh, the idea of creationism and things like that now. That wasn't always a problem. Here's something to consider. While Europe was in the Dark Ages, the Abbasid Caliphs in Baghdad this would have been in the 800s or so. They created a house of wisdom and started collecting works in Persian, in Greek, in Indian, and tr started translating them into Arabic because this was an act of piety. They thought there would be good Muslims if they did this, and the works of folks like Aristotle uh, were preserved in this way in Plato. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are things that are helpful to us trying to understand Egyptian herbal medicine because there were Greeks that wrote about it when, you know, they went on their travels during the Ptolemaic period. Those works got preserved by the Abbasid Caliph in Baghdad in the Dark Ages. And another thing to consider, if you're interested in astronomy, a lot of star names like Betelgeuse, Rigel, uh, Dubé, Mayrak, those are the two pointer stars in the Big Dipper. All of those names are Arabic because of Arab astronomers that uh, gave these things names that we still use today. Here's another fun fact in the world of astronomy. The father of backyard astronomy, am amateur astronomy, was an ordained Anglican minister. His name was Reverend Thomas William Webb. He actually built an observatory in the backyard of his parsonage, and he wrote a book that was considered the go-to book until the 1950s for backyard astronomers. Obviously, science had no conflict with his sense of faith. And that's something that I think more of us should pay attention to, especially in the climate that we live in now, when you have radical religious fundamentalists of varying faiths, uh, opposed to people who are staunchly atheist, and believe that science is really the only way to explain the world. And I would like to point out what they might be forgetting is the fact that science keeps changing too. Our science is not perfect. Uh, it is still adding new knowledge all the time. So the way we understand something now, you know, we could find something that validates, you know, other faiths, you know, in ways that we wouldn't have expected. One other thing I do have to point out for the folks that are flat earthers. Um, there's a guy who just recently fired a rocket and uh, he's a flat earther. He managed to get enough money to test a rocket out in the desert. Good! I hope he fires another one that actually takes him into low orbit because then he'll see the curvature of the earth. 
because I'm sorry, the earth is round. And there are things that we can see in the world around us without having to go in outer space that support that. The reason why we have phases of the moon and the moon looks like a crescent, all of you Wiccans would know about this. You have the waxing crescent, the full moon, the waning crescent. Well, that's caused by the earth's shadow being when the earth and the sun are in the right position with the moon, earth's shadow is being cast and earth's shadow is round. If the earth were flat, then you might have a shadow that at some point could divide the moon in two or something, but it doesn't because it's round, just as the moon is round, just as the sun is round. If you take a time exposure photograph of stars, uh, the ones closer to the northern section of the sky will be turning because the earth is turning. Uh, when people go into a zero gravity environment and they uh, let out a bottle of juice or something, notice the juice forms into round globules because that's what matter does in a zero g environment. It's like outer space, all of the matter that is uh, the earth coalesced into a sphere. So it really doesn't take a whole lot. I know people are trying to be um, thoughtful and questioning, you know, what everyone considers a status quo by saying, well, is the earth really round? There are other ways to question the status quo besides saying, oh, dude, the earth is flat. Because even the ancient Greeks actually knew the world was round. That's another thing that uh, uh, they don't teach properly in school. Columbus was not trying to prove that the earth was round. They did know that at the time. He was just trying to prove a shorter way to get to India and ended up finding the Caribbean instead. So, more fun facts. As a comedic, I find it important to remember that uh, there are multiple answers to the big questions. You know, how did we get here? Why are we here? What's going to happen? Sometimes it takes more than one answer to solve it. You know, who created the universe? Was it a tomb? Neat? Pata? E equals MC squared? How about all of the above? We can't just say it's this and only this. That's not the best way to answer big questions like that. You know, we have our whole lifetimes to think about these kinds of questions and, you know, to come up with our answers. Really, why turn your paper in early? That's my thought on the matter. So, this has been another Comedic Bite. I've had fun with this one. Uh, keep your questions coming. I will answer them as soon as I can. And I'm working on getting a video together on semi-bells. Hopefully that one will be a lot of fun. In the meantime, let me wish you some empty. Do you have a question about Egyptian paganism? Share it in the comments section, and it could be the topic of the next Comedic Bite. Don't forget to subscribe and check the video description for more ways to support the Comedic Independent Channel.